Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome tonight. Uh, we really are excited about the opportunity to talk to you. A problem for men. Those guys are able to join tonight. We're excited to have you on. We're going to be going over uh, BPH and some really um, uh, kind of some new and novel ways that we can treat BPH um, issues for guys and ways that uh, um, really get to the heart of getting guys back to uh, a quality of life that they expect and in some ways in this day and age deserve. So we're excited to have you guys here. And um, my name is Joff Ledgerwood. I'm a board certified urologist that practices in the south side of town. And I've uh, been practicing here in the community for almost 12 years now. And a big portion of my practice is uh, BPH and taking care of these issues. And I work um, hand in hand with uh, several providers in town. And one of those people would be Dr. Green, who will be coming on a little later to talk about um, how interventional radiology um, can be helpful in, uh, in the setting of BPH uh, symptoms. So welcome tonight. Great to have you. And I hope this is an informative time. Go ahead, Tom. Let's see if we can get that first slide up. So I just want to talk briefly through the kind of evaluation management of BPH. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, men uh, talk about um, having urinary complaints. Well, that is, um, that's a large umbrella of a lot of things that can be going on basically um, uh, within a patient. Now, we often hear about, you know, heard about, seen the commercials, what people complain about, um, you know, enlarging prostate symptoms, having to go a lot, uh, waking up at night, um, the guys out in the golf course running to the bathroom, um, and those are all from a lot of pharma and uh, different medication um, companies that make medications that help treat. Uh, BPH symptoms, but I think it's important to understand a little bit of what's actually happening. Um, BPH actually stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. So it's growth of the prostate gland, and there's a little schematic here that you guys can see. On the left side is a more of a normal situation where you have the bladder, and the bladder drains through the middle part of the prostate through an area called the urethra, and that takes urine on outside of the body. It's a very common process as men get older that the prostate grows, and there's lots of different reasons why it grows and ways we can treat that. But as the prostate grows, it gets bigger on the outside, but this little picture on the right side gives you a good idea. Not only grows large on the outside, but it actually grows on the inside, effectively pinching off that tube that drains urine from the bladder called the urethra. And this is where the bladder just can have a very hard time generating pressure and force to overcome the resistance of the prostate. So, like I said, this is very common with age. Um, oftentimes, you know, I tell patients that from the field can have BPH. Sixty percent of sixty-year-olds uh, experience BPH symptoms. Seventy percent of seventy-year-olds experience BPH symptoms. Eighty percent of eighty-year-olds experience BPH symptoms. Um, the manifestations of BPH are what we call lower urinary tract symptoms, or LUTS. Um, they're subjective things, and they're kind of different categories. Irritative voiding symptoms with frequency, urgency of urination, nocturia, which means waking up at night to go to the bathroom. And you can also have obstructive voiding symptoms, weak scream, hesitancy, incomplete emptying. Um, objectively, where sometimes patients even don't even realize this is going on, you can actually have what's called urinary retention. Um, and that can, uh, when that, that can lead towards actually back pressure of urine all the way up to the kidneys, where you have kidney impairment or kidney or uh, loss of kidney function, which is a very significant um, issue, as you can imagine. You know, 30 years ago, the most common reason for a kidney transplant was basically urinary retention for BPH, where men would actually lose the function of their kidneys. You can have bladder stones, recurrent urinary tract infections, and blood in the urine, which is also called hematuria. Go ahead, Tom. Next slide. So, as a general. Sure, no problem. Um, the, there's a general flow sheet that we have when it comes to evaluation and management of these things. That there's initial intake that we have. There's this thing called an IPP, IPSS, excuse me, uh, score. Uh, and that's just basically uh, uh, a survey that we have men take, kind of describing their symptoms. Um, history and physical is important. We like to do urinalyses to make sure there's no obvious urinary tract infection. 
that uh, PVR stands for post void residual or a way that we can actually scan the bladder to make sure you're emptying all the way. That's important. Um, PSA levels, and that's a blood marker for the relative health of the prostate, um, as well as giving patients information about enlarging prostate. So from that, we basically categorize people into three different large categories. One is a mild symptoms, uh, where it's not too bothered by that. And even though we don't think it's, we, we think it's mild, it's something that's so bothersome to the patient, moderate to severe symptoms. And as well as, hey, you might actually have uh, a condition where you're on acute retention, which means you can't empty your bladder at all, or there's other neurologic reasons why you can't empty your bladder. Go ahead, Tom. So as you kind of see this flow sheet as we follow it all down, um, we for moderate to severe LUTs in the urology space, oftentimes we talk about uh, things like resumes or TUMPs. We evaluate this by doing uh, basically flow studies. Um, that's with the Eurocuff, and as well as taking a look inside people's bladders with a cystoscopy, and consider even getting prostate ultrasound um, uh, to get an idea about actually how big the prostate really is. Oftentimes, uh, by evaluating what's called a Eurocuff there, it's a, an office-based procedure where we can get an idea about how much pressure the bladder is generating to void and how fast things come out. We can either observe it, treat it with medications, or actually consider other types of procedures to get a better idea about what's going on. Um, if medic medications can be helpful, some people like to be on medications. Um, even though medications are helpful, doesn't mean some people like to be on medications, so there's other things that we consider along the way. If it's more of an acute retention issue, we talk about you know, neurologic issues. There's other things we do, not only with identifying the size of the prostate, but also to evaluate the really functionality of the bladder. They both have to work well in order for you to void. The prostate area has to be open, allowing you to pass through. But your bladder also has to be strong enough to generate a good enough squeeze to get urine to come on out. Go ahead, Tom. So I kind of just blew this up here a little bit. I want to focus a little bit more down on the uh, on the left side of this. So after we've taken a look inside, again, if we've realized this is an obstructive situation, uh, there's options that we can do within the office. Um, and that's why it's important to be working not only with the interventional radiologist who can do prostate and arterial embolization, which is Dr. Green will explain much more detail about. But there's other procedures that we can do that are in even that are minimally invasive as well in the office. And a lot of it just depends and it comes down to the shape and the size of the prostate. And you can see here that um, I've kind of circled a red circle in that area in the space that we have in this flow sheet where really prostate arterial embolization has a large role to play in what's going on. So I think just to, this is to try to lay a little bit of the groundwork that um, when you have voiding complaints, the most important thing is that you tell people about it and ask for help along the way to see what's going on. I have had patients who have shown up to my office for 10 years who were having complaints, and they didn't realize over that time frame that, um, that they were losing bladder functionality. So if you do have symptoms, and it's some of the reason why we hope that you're actually watching um, this, uh, this wirecast tonight, is that you're actually, you want to seek out some help. Because it's really important. Now, there might be mild things that are going on and simple things that we can fix. We just want to make sure we're not missing more serious things where left untreated, you can have permanent bladder dysfunction where um, it's really hard to do anything to get you voiding normally again. So. We just love the fact that you guys are curious about this and you're pressing into this as a urologist and someone who cares a lot about bladder preservation and maintaining good bladder function. I'm glad you guys are here tonight and would love to hear a little bit more of what Dr. Green has to say about prostate arterial embolization. Also, get a first hand take on. Um, uh, on a patient that we have that's had this procedure done to get a better idea about what's going on. Thanks, Tom. Perfect.
Okay, sorry about that. So, hi everybody, my name is Tyler Green. I'm an interventional radiologist uh, here in the, in the Denver area. We're, uh, I work with a group called Radiology Imaging Associates, and we're a group of uh, 12 interventional radiologists who practice here in the Denver area uh, with an office in the uh, Denver Tech Center. Uh, my practice is mostly at Sky Ridge Medical Center uh, down in Lone Tree, but we do several hospitals around town. So. Um, uh, the folks at Skyridge asked us to talk a little bit about prostatic artery embolization, uh, which is probably newer uh, for M benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. And so, um, uh, big thanks to Dr. Ledger for coming on and uh, our urology expert to provide some of the background on uh, BPH in general and sort of all of the evaluation that goes into making sure that somebody you know, is being properly treated for their BPH. So um, with that background, I'll move forward and go ahead and talk a little bit about BPH here so we can move to the slides. Go to the next slide. So here's just a quick outline of what I wanted to touch on, and there's obviously a lot we could talk about, but I wanted to try and focus on some of the questions that I thought people might have about, um, about prostatic artery embolization, or PAE for short. So we're gonna talk about what, what is PAE, uh, how is the procedure performed, um, how do we decide if someone is a good candidate for PAE, and then sort of what to expect after the PAE procedure's been done in terms of symptoms. And um, of course, anyone considering a pre procedure would want to know what the side effects or risks of the procedure might be. So I'll touch on that as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So PAE, um, you know, there are many different ways to treat an enlarged prostate and um, all of those except for PAE are performed by a urologist. Um, we, uh, interventional radiologists, uh, perform this procedure, prostatic artery embolization, or PAE. Um, and um, I guess I should just back up for a minute and sort of explain briefly what an interventional radiologist is. So what we are is uh, we are uh, physicians who have um, expertise in imaging, uh, medical imaging and also in using medical imaging to guide um, the performance of minimally invasive procedures. And that sort of may sound confusing, but um, might become actually more clear as I go through this presentation. Um, we perform procedures all over the body, uh, minimally invasive procedures, using image guidance. So. By image guidance, I mean we use X-ray or CT or ultrasound, different imaging techniques to be able to see inside of the patient's body without opening them up. And being able to see inside the body with these imaging tools, we can then guide instruments safely to different parts of the body in order to deliver some form of treatment or therapy for a wide variety of conditions. So. To bring it back to prostatic artery embolization, the way that a PAE works is we are using x-ray, an imaging tool, to see inside of the patient so that we can guide a blood vessel catheter into the arteries that supply blood to the prostate. And from there, we shut down the blood flow to the prostate. And by shutting down the blood flow to the prostate, the prostate gland shrinks over time, relieving the symptoms of blockage, um, of, of urinary blockage caused by an enlarged prostate. So again, the goal is to shut down blood flow to the prostate. Let's go to the next slide. So how is PAE performed? The procedure is, we perform the procedure at the hospital um, you come in the morning of the procedure, uh, you come to the pre-op area, we check some lab work. And this is, of course, after we've seen you in our clinic and you've seen your urologist, and we've obviously determined you're a good candidate for the procedure, which we'll get into later. But procedures performed at the hospital, you come in, an IV started, 
And then um, after some lab work is done, we bring you over to the procedure room where we give you uh, medication to help you feel comfortable and relaxed. So that type of sedation is called conscious sedation. And it means that you're awake and breathing on your own throughout the procedure. You know that you're there, um, but you basically don't care. And you're just relaxed. You may tell us some interesting stories as the procedure goes on. And uh, what's, what's said in interventional radiology stays in interventional radiology. So you're safe with us. All right, let's go to the next slide. So after you're sedated, um, I numb up the skin overlying the artery um, uh, in front of the hip, the artery in the groin called the femoral artery. Once you're numbed up and you're sedated, I make a small puncture into that artery so that I can insert a catheter into the blood vessel. We then advance that catheter, which is only about two millimeters in diameter, up into the arteries in the pelvis. Through that catheter, we take pictures of the arteries in the pelvis to identify um, or to determine where the prostatic arteries are arising from. The prostatic arteries are very small. Uh, they tend to be only a millimeter to, to two, two and a half millimeters in diameter. And where they arise from in the pelvis is variable from person to person. So this can be one of the challenges with prostatic artery embolization. This picture here is a picture of uh, an angiogram, meaning a picture of blood vessels that we've taken of somebody's, of the right side of somebody's pelvic arteries. And the small blood vessel that I'm pointing to with my pen in that picture is this person's right prosthetic artery. Let's go to the next slide. After we've identified the where the prostatic artery is, we then go into advance a smaller catheter called a microcatheter, which is only um, about one millimeter in diameter, down into the small artery that supplies blood to the prostate. So the image on the left is an angiogram or a picture of the right prostatic artery, uh, which uh, in this patient. So we take pictures in a couple of different views, very high quality pictures to be, um, to be sure that we're in the blood vessel that goes to the prostate. At the hospital, we can then do an additional um, type of picture called a cone beam CT, um, which really is a newer technology where the x-ray machine actually spins around the patient, acquiring images as we're injecting contrast into the prostatic artery. And then amazingly, the, the machine is able to recreate a CT scan that allows me to go through the pictures slice by slice through thin sections to get very detailed pictures of the artery to be sure that it's, number one, to be sure that it's safe to shut down blood flow in this artery that we're in with our catheter. And number two, to make sure that when we shut down the blood flow to this artery that it's shutting down blood flow throughout this whole side of the prostate and that there's not perhaps a second prostatic artery that we need to go searching for in order to have a complete treatment. So the, the image on the right is one of these cone beam CT images that we take, which can be very helpful. Uh, let's go to the next image, next slide. Once we've determined that it's safe to um, shut down the blood flow in the, in the prostatic artery, and that that prostatic artery is not sending off branches to adjacent pelvic organs that we don't want to shut down blood flow to. So once we've determined it's safe, then we inject particles, these spherical particles um, that range in size, uh, range in, in different sizes, but very small particles into that prostatic artery. Um, and the way that this works specifically is the image on the left there shows a vial of the particles we use. I use a product called Embospheres, which is, has an FDA indication for this specific procedure. The spherical particles um, are suspended in a solution of contrast. So when I inject them, I can see they show up because they're in X-ray dye or contrast, and I can see them moving forward. And as I inject them out of that catheter, the blood flow carries them forward and they lodge in the small branches of the prostatic artery 
in the prostate gland itself, gradually shutting down the blood flow to the prostate. Um, the image in the middle is a picture of these particular, this particular product uh, called Embospheres that um, they, the ones that I use uh, typically range in size from 300 to 500 microns in diameter. So they're about a third to a half of a millimeter in diameter. Um, and very small. And then the image on the right is a microscopic image of one of these particles in um, some sort of uh, translucent tube showing that the particles are, are somewhat flexible. It's a permanent um, a synthetic material, again, FDA approved for this procedure. Um, and different people use different products for this procedure, but this is a uh, product that's been used widely for this procedure and it's uh, been found to be safe and effective. So um, I'm very used to using this product, so that's what I use. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So that's, that's really how we perform the procedure. Um, I guess to back up a step then, um, we, we should ask ourselves how do, we, how do we figure out who is a candidate for PAE? So it really comes down to starting out with your urologist who is, you know, as I told you, I'm an expert in imaging and performing minimally invasive procedures all over the body on a wide variety of organ systems and uh, different treating different disease conditions. A urologist is a specialist in the genital urinary tract um, of which the prostate, the bladder, and the urethra, all, all of which come into play here, they're a specialist in these organ systems. So if you come, you know, uh, to your primary care doctor, for example, complaining of, you know, a weak urinary stream or, you know, a, um, uh, you know, having a strain to urinate or some of these symptoms that we do see with BPH, well, BPH is a very common condition and it would be um, largely safe to assume that, you know, or, or it would be um, not incorrect to, to think that there's a high likelihood that those kinds of symptoms may be coming from an enlarged prostate. And your, your primary care doctor can certainly assess you and do an exam and see if you have an enlarged prostate. But ultimately there are other conditions that can cause all these same symptoms so it's very important that you, um, you know, certainly before you start thinking about having a procedure or a surgery on your prostate, that you see a urologist who can really assess you in detail and make sure that, you know, your symptoms aren't coming from maybe something wrong with your bladder or maybe a side effect of a medication you're on or maybe a narrowing in your urethra that's not from an enlarged prostate. And really make sure that we're moving down the right um, right road with the treatments that we're embarking upon. So number one is see a urologist, get a good exam, really figure out, figure out with confidence what's going on. Once, once you're diagnosed with BPH or benign enlargement of the prostate, then really the, the first step is to modify your lifestyle. So if you're getting up at night five times to, to pee, um, but you're drinking a pot of coffee before you go to bed. Um, that you know that would be an example of a lifestyle um, uh, choice that could be modified to minimize how much you're getting up at, at night. So obvious, simple things should be adjusted to try and improve your symptoms, and then trying some medications, which are, are less invasive thing to try than than any procedure. But once you've gone through these lifestyle modifications and you've tried medications and if your symptoms are still kind of in that moderate to severe range and very bothersome, then it's maybe time to start thinking about what procedures, whether it's a minimally invasive surgical or interventional radiology procedure um, or potentially a more invasive operation are available to you. Um, so what what surgical or procedural options are available to a given patient really depends on the size of the prostate and on the shape or the way in which the prostate is enlarged. Prostates um, can enlarge in different shapes and that can have an impact on what surgical or uh, treatment options are available to you. Um, other considerations when deciding what might be the best option for a given patient may include, you know, do you need to be on blood thinning medications? And if so, um, you know, that can come into play into deciding what treatment options may be best for you. Another consideration, of course, is what other medical conditions you may be dealing with 
and you know certain medical conditions may make it unsafe to undergo a procedure that might require general anesthesia, for example. It may be best to consider a, a more minimally invasive option. So it's really a multifactorial decision that needs to be made um, you know, with your primary care doctor, your urologist, and ultimately, of course, we're happy to talk to you too if PAE seems like potentially a good option for you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is a busy slide, but just to, to get a little deeper into who might be a candidate specifically for PAE. So let's first focus on the top bullet points. So situations where, where I feel PAE should be strongly considered. So I think when patients have a very large prostate, um, you know, kind of getting up into that 100 grams, 100 milliliter size and bigger, the, I think that, and, and Joff can feel free to correct me if he feels differently, certainly, but I think that um, as the prostate becomes very large, the, um, the minimally invasive treatment options that a urologist has to offer begin to diminish and PAE becomes, I think, a very attractive, uh, minimally invasive option that should be strongly considered. Um, other situations where PAE should be strongly considered would be in patients who um, need to be on blood thinning medications and really shouldn't be off them for a long time. So for example, somebody with a um, prosthetic heart valve that needs to be on anticoagulation medicines or somebody maybe with a coronary artery stent who needs to be on antiplatelet drugs like Plavix or aspirin can't come off them. Well PAE because we're shutting down blood flow to the prostate rather than carving out a channel to open up the prostate um, surgically is going to have uh, you know really has a very low bleeding risk so we can do that with patients continuing their antiplatelet drugs straight through the procedure and potentially only stopping their anticoagulant drugs for a very short period of time before and after the procedure so it can be advantageous for those people. Um, another time to consider PAE is just really when when other procedures other minimally invasive therapies may be off the table um, based on the size and shape of your prostate um, but, uh, but perhaps you're not a candidate to, to go under general anesthesia for a more invasive option, then we can consider doing a PAE, which can be done with you um, just, as I said, under conscious sedation. Um, and so given its minimally invasive nature, that can be good for patients with serious, uh, potentially serious heart uh, issues. Um, I think then where it become, can become more challenging is in patients with mildly to moderately enlarged prostates. The reason it's challenging, you know, good and bad, those patients have a wide variety of options available to them. And of course, you're gonna talk to your urologist and they're going to, um, you know, let you know what they think your best treatment options are. And, um, and they'll talk to you about the pros and cons of these uh, different treatment options. And PAE may be one of those options. And, you know, so it's something that they can talk to you about too and and we'd be happy to see see you as well but um, that that just becomes a challenging you know challenging in the sense that there there are a wide variety of treatment options for patients with kind of mildly to moderately enlarged prostates um, situations where we might not want to consider looking down at the bottom of the slide where we might not uh, we, we would where we would either definitely want to shy away from PAE or or be very careful about it would be patients who have advanced renal failure, kidney failure, um, because the contrast that we inject into the arteries to take pictures of the arteries is hard on the kidneys. So if we then uh, take somebody with bad kidneys and start injecting contrast, that could push them into worsening kidney failure. So depending on the severity of the kidney failure, uh, we have to either be very careful about that or just, or PAE may not be an option at all in more advanced cases of kidney failure. Also, of course, if you have a contrast allergy that's severe, uh, we would not want to be giving you contrast. Uh, patients with more mild allergies to contrast, we can, uh, we can manage that by giving you some medication to in advance to prevent contrast reactions. Another issue that can be somewhat difficult to predict uh, how much it's going to be a problem in advance is atherosclerosis or narrowing of the blood vessels. So this atherosclerosis is a common condition becoming increasingly common as people age, more common in elderly patients. Um, and so, um, 
you know, as I showed you, we have to be able to advance a catheter up through these arteries and ultimately down into the very small prostatic arteries in order to be successful at completing this procedure. So if somebody has advanced atherosclerosis, we may not be able to complete the procedure. And if I suspect that after I've seen you in clinic and done a, a physical exam, if I suspect that you may have severe atherosclerosis, sometimes we'll perform a special type of CT scan that's meant to look at the arteries in the pelvis and give us some assessment in advance of how advanced or not is your atherosclerosis to give us an idea of if we're gonna be able to complete this procedure or not. Bottom line is sometimes the prostatic arteries, we can't always see them on the CT scan, and sometimes it ends up being a situation where we try to do the PAE, but find that the blockages in the uh, prostatic arteries that prevent us from getting into them. So move on to the next slide. So after, after the PAE procedure, I'm not sure, um, somebody's talking and it's coming through, at least to me, um, it might just need to mute that. Um, so what to expect after the PAE procedure? Um, so afterwards, we, you know, after the procedure's done, you go to the recovery room, you lie flat for a couple of hours to minimize the risk of any bleeding from the groin. Uh, a bladder catheter is placed during the procedure after you're sedated and it's removed immediately after the procedure. Patients go home without a bladder catheter in place as long as they're able to urinate before they go. Um, the exception to that would be somebody who's coming to us in urinary retention with a bladder catheter that's been in place leading up to the procedure. Those patients, we do the procedure and then attempt to remove the, the catheter approximately one to two weeks later and make sure you can Void and empty your bladder before um, uh, before you go. Um, so slight variation there, but uh, most patients uh, who come to us without a catheter in place uh, go home without one the same day as the procedure is performed without a catheter. Um, we do prescribe a handful of new medications immediately after the procedure that are taken for a few days. Um, the uh, One is an antibiotic to minimize the risk of any urinary tract infection. Uh, one is an anti-inflammatory medication to just calm any inflammation that's caused by the procedure. Um, we prescribe a medication to minimize bladder spasm, which you'll see is a common side effect of the procedure. And then um, the fourth is a prescription pain medication in case it's needed, um, though most people do find after the procedure just taking Tylenol or over-the-counter medicines is the the pain tends not to be very significant afterwards. Um, and then uh, as far as our follow-up goes, uh, you know, you get a call from our nurse to check in within a few days of the procedure, make sure everything's okay. Um, and if everything's going well, then we see you back in clinic at the one month mark and then we go from there. Um, next slide, please. So, after the procedure, we kind of ask you to take it easy for a couple of days. No, you know, not jumping on your mountain bike immediately afterwards and crashing down the mountain. Um, but, but really, you're able to go home and kind of resume uh, typical activities aside from heavy exercise, which we ask you to shy away from for a few days just to minimize the risk of any bleeding from the groin. Um, typically, people are able to return, though, to full activity within five to seven days of the procedure. Um, again, we don't expect much in the way of pain after the procedure. After we shut down blood flow to the prostate, um, as I said, the prostate gland, part of the prostate gland dies um, and that the dead tissue is reabsorbed by your body, causing the prostate to shrink gradually. The prostate shrinks mostly over the course of the first month, but does continue to shrink somewhat more out to the three month mark. So symptoms typically improve a lot by the time I see you back in clinic one month after the procedure, and um, but continue to improve for three months after the procedure. On average, um, just looking at different studies, um, we see symptom improvement, uh, symptoms improving by about 50 to 70% on average. And that's using this questionnaire that Dr. Ledgerwood referred to earlier called the IPSS questionnaire, uh, where patients answer seven questions about their urinary symptoms, kind of rating them, um, and leading to a total score. 
we see that score decreasing by about 50 to 70 percent, indicating a 50 to 70 percent symptom uh, improvement in symptoms. Um, now, some patients improve consi considerably more than that, and some pa patients improve considerably less than that. So, this is an average. Um, so, let's go to the next slide. So one more busy slide here, but basically, you know, people of course want to know what are the side effects or risks of any procedure that they're considering doing. So a common, and this, this slide shows a mix of what I would consider um, more so side effects and, uh, and risks. Uh, side effects being things that are common and can be um, almost expected to some extent after the procedure, not necessarily considered a complication. Um, and then um, risks would be things that I would consider a complication. So we'll just run through these. So these numbers that I've listed here, you know, you're going to see different risk profiles depending on what study you look at. So I thought it was um, best just to look at the biggest study of patients that's been reported who've gone through a PAE procedure. So that was a study out of a group in Portugal. Um, lead author was uh, Dr. Pisco and he was really a pioneer in this procedure. So they um, reported their results on 630 patients that they treated, and here's basically the, the side effects or risks that they reported. Um, so bladder irritation, in my experience, is a common side effect of this procedure. The, the bladder sits right on top of the prostate, so the bladder can become irritated after this procedure, um, leading to you know people feeling like they have to pee more frequently than they did before the procedure, um, or getting up more frequently at night than they were before the procedure. That, that just resolves on its own, but it can take a few days or even up to five to seven, five days to a week to resolve in patients who experience that. That's a side effect that we see in about a quarter of patients. Um, other side effects that can be seen are just very small amounts of blood in the urine or the ejaculate or the stool afterwards. And that's probably from beads getting into these adjacent organs through blood vessels that are just too small to even see on these types of angiograms that I've shown you. Um, and you know, these, this blood in these um, uh, bodily fluids, if you experience that, this tends to also just resolve on its own within a few days. But we warn people about that so they're not, not alarmed. Um, by these, these types of things that could be otherwise alarming. Um, urinary tract infections. The authors here reported a 5% risk of urinary tract infection, which really hasn't been my experience. We see much lower rates of urinary tract infection, but I will say we're very careful to avoid that. So, you know, we check your urine beforehand to make sure there's no signs of infection. If there are infections, we treat those before and make sure they're cleared before we put you through the procedure. Um, and as I said, we prescribe some antibiotics um, for a few days afterwards to minimize the risk of any infection. But that is, it is a risk of the procedure. Um, urinary retention. So urinary retention means you're unable to pee after the procedure. So the prostate can swell a little bit before the swelling goes down and the prostate begins to shrink. So there's a small risk that if you weren't in urinary retention and you were able to pee before the procedure, that we do the procedure and then all of a sudden you're having difficulty urinating, we may need to place a bladder catheter back in, into your bladder or place a bladder catheter potentially for the first time into your bladder. And we would typically leave that in if that were to happen for a few days, uh, potentially a week, and then um, remove that catheter. And by then certainly the, any inflammation from the procedure should, should have died down and should be able to pee. Um, but uh, that is one risk of the procedure. Hematoma or bleeding at the site where we puncture the artery is a, is a uh, risk of any procedure where we're puncturing into that artery. Um, one important, um, potentially serious complication of PAE, though fortunately very uncommon, is uh, what, what I would just call non-target embolization, meaning shutting down blood flow to tissues that we did not intend to shut down blood flow to. So the prostatic artery can have branches that go to the bladder, the penis, or the rectum. And so clearly we don't want to be injecting particles into um, you know, significant blood vessels that go to these organs or tissues. And that's why we're so careful to obtain just the highest, highest quality images uh, with these special techniques and avoid that kind of a complication. 
Um, in the literature, you know, fortunately I haven't experienced these complications myself, but in the literature when these things happen, you know, frequently uh, uh, the complications of that are, are just closely monitored and resolved on their own, but in theory could lead to, to the need for surgery to repair more serious complications. And then finally, I always talk to my patients about the risk of technical failure, meaning, meaning that we're, we may be unable to get into your prostatic artery, either because there's a blockage from atherosclerosis or there's a very sharp angle at which it comes off from, from the vessel before it. We just can't get a catheter to go down that artery. So there is um, some risk that we're, we bring you for the procedure and we're unable to successfully complete it. And that's important to understand going into it. And then lastly, a risk of clinical failure, meaning the procedure went well, I'm very happy with how everything looked, but for whatever reason, your symptoms don't improve adequately. And that's important to understand, that could happen. Um, and I, I would say one of the nice things about PAE is we're really not burning any bridges by, by going down the road of PAE. There should be no reason you can't have another procedure in the event that you try a PAE, uh, but your symptoms don't adequately improve. All right, let's go to the next slide. So from that same study of 630 patients out of Portugal, um, you know, what, what was unique about um, PAE is that we don't see um, complications that can be very, um, very bothersome for some guys, um, including urinary incontinence or, or uh, involuntary leakage or, or urination. We don't see erectile dysfunction caused by PAE. And we don't see retrograde ejaculation, or uh, which can be a side effect of some other procedures and some medications. Um, so that's you know that's based on this one study. I think it would be hard to say uh, with certainty that these things don't ever happen, um, but certainly in this big big study, these types of complications were not seen. So uh, next slide, please. So this last one, I just wanted to leave you with our clinic contact information. But I would say, you know, really the highest yield for you, the highest yield um, path for any, anyone to go down with prostate issues is definitely going to be to see your urologist first and to, um, to be evaluated, to really get that proper urologic evaluation and really make sure that, that your symptoms are truly caused by benign enlargement of the prostate or BPH. And then if your urologist thinks that you would be potentially a candidate for PAE and it's something that you want to get more information about, um, that's the contact information for our clinic. And, and of course, we'd be happy to see anybody and answer questions. And, and we always work in conjunction with your urologist. So thanks for the time. I'm sorry that probably was a little more time than I should have taken, but hopefully it answers some questions. I'd like to turn it over to to Paul Roebuck uh, now, who's graciously volunteered his time to share his experience with the PAE procedure. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm a patient of, of Dr. Green's and uh, I w underwent this procedure um, in May of this year. Um, as Dr. Ledgerwood um, indicated, some patients should go to their urologists a lot earlier than um, than I did. I was diagnosed with BPH um, 12 or 13 years ago, and I didn't like any of the alternatives. Uh, I didn't want to have surgery, and I didn't want to go on drugs. I thought that the potential side effects of of uh, the normal or uh, the the common treatments were things I didn't want to. I didn't want to subject myself to. So I modified my behavior. I didn't see a urologist for 10 years. But this spring, I ended up in the emergency room with uh, acute urinary retention. And I got catheterized for 10 days or so. And that drove me back to saying, OK, we've got to do something about this. It turns out my prostate uh, was too large to be um, for several procedures uh, to work well. And PAE then became um, the most um, likely treatment that I could undergo. Um, I went to uh, RIA and met with Dr. Green. And actually, it was at the beginning of COVID, so we, we met 
in a tele meeting, which I appreciated them being able to accommodate me. And then um, I was concerned that I wouldn't be a good candidate, so I um, asked that we have a CT scan done first to make sure that my arteries uh, were appropriate for the procedure, and that, that went very smoothly. Um, the procedure itself was was um, really no problem at all. Everyone was very pleasant. Uh, it went very smoothly. Um, my main objection was that I had to have a Foley catheter during the procedure, and all of the negative symptoms I experienced were really from the catheterization. The irritation to the uh, to my urethra and to my bladder really come, came, I think, from the Foley catheterization, and those took. Um, 10 or 11 days to resolve after the procedure. But after those went away, I was astounded to see that um, my, uh, process, my lower urinary tract symptoms uh, improved almost right away. I had had a IPSS score of 30 um, because I experienced almost all of the symptoms except for nocturia um, within Within two and a half weeks of the uh, procedure, or three weeks of the of the PAE procedure, my score is down to four. Um, it was um, the only symptom related to the to the procedure itself I had was a little bit of bruising at the at the at the point of, of entry, but I I I have to say it's um, it's been. A very good experience for me all the way around. I particularly liked working with with Dr. Green and his his team, and I highly recommend that anybody who's a good candidate for this seriously consider it. Thanks. I'll leave it open for questions now. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Green and Paul. Thank you very much. Um, as of right now, we don't have any questions um, that are listed. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Not me, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very, thank you both very much, and thank you, Dr. Ledgerwood, as well. Um, and have a great evening.